You're listening to the Zoe Turner Podcast. Business and mindset conversations that will help you move from fear and uncertainty to development and growth so that you can crush both life and business. Please welcome your host, Zoe Turner. So I was speaking to Mike and he's coming from live all the way from Lanzarote. So it's Dubai, Lanzarote. So I would like to welcome Mike to the podcast today. Mike helps entrepreneurs with their, he basically helps make their side hustle become a full-time profession. Welcome to the podcast today, Mike. How are you? I'm okay, Zoe. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on. Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate you you coming on. Let's just delve a little bit more into your background, Mike. Uh, you and I have recently, uh, we've recently just connected. And what's quite unique about yourself is um, you're an entrepreneur. You live in R- 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 Lanzarote. Um, you have cystic fibrosis. Um, I'd like to just delve into that a little bit, like, what is cystic fibrosis for, and how has that impacted on your development over the years and, and kind of like on your career in any way? Well, when I was about two months old, when they do the, the sort of baby tests to see if you have any conditions or allergies or whatever it is, um, that's when I was diagnosed. So I think it was the uh, sort of the prick on the heel or something where they test for as much as they can. Um, that was what the test that they they used and in, in a nutshell cf is it's a condition that affects my lungs and my digestive system mostly uh, so i'm not as fit as the average person that doesn't have my conditions um and it's how it's affected me well when i was younger it didn't really do a lot because you know, it, it's it's school. You're you're keeping active. You're playing sports. You're doing all the things that that kids do, and it was just fun because the doctors were like, he has to keep active. He has to keep himself fit. Otherwise, he could go downhill quite quickly because it's it is a degenerative disease, which is a fancy way of saying it gets worse over time. That's kind of the, the technical term is. De- degenerative, uh, very hard word Does to pronounce. Does that mean the older you get, it gets worse? Okay. Exactly right, yeah. So when you're like 30 or 40, it's difficult compared to when you're in your 20s and when you're like single digits. So especially when my parents were like, okay, we actually want to save this child because I, I failed to thrive as a baby. So the doctors were like, you've got a choice here. Um, they were like, right, we've got to take responsibility now. We've got to look after him. He's got to do everything that the doctors say and more, right? So I did all the sports wherever I could, uh, mostly because I was dragged into it, whether I liked it or not. But that was that was what it was like. It was you've got to do this thing. <clears throat> and then when I was in my 20s, um, I was a personal trainer. So I took exercise to the extreme and I started to help others. So I got to a point where I wasn't the same as everybody else. I was fitter than everybody else. And, you know, I was doing a lot to get that way. So from sport to the gym to you name it, I was doing it. I was doing everything that I could. And that allowed me to be ahead of everyone else in terms of what I knew, what I learned over the years. And helping others was one of the, the main things that I felt that that I wanted to do. I think there was a part of me that felt not so much selfish for looking after myself like for like hours a day, trying to look after myself and keep myself healthy. But I think there was a sense of, I've got to balance the scales somehow. That I can't just focus on me all the time. There's gotta be something like outside of my bubble, you know? So there was a part of me that wanted to help people and, and improve people because I had to spend so long doing it to myself and I sort of felt a bit of like responsibility to others because I I spent so long doing things for me that it felt natural to want to do things for others. It goes without saying that you're someone that likes to excel, someone that likes to defy the odds and and show people that anything is possible. Yeah, I mean, the, despite my, should we say, lesser starting point, um, 
I was very, very competitive. Um, I used to play tennis. I used to play basketball, which I'm about five foot six, five foot seven when I wear shoes. So I play tall people's sports and I was a midget. So, but I'm not a midget, but compared to like six foot, God knows how old, how tall people, <laughs> I was classed as a midget. So, I mean, I managed to keep up. I managed to do okay. Um, not, I mean, you're never going to, I can't out jump someone that doesn't need to jump. So it was it was one of those situations where I got to a point where my height did actually become the reason why I was never going to get any better. So I practice all the time. It was every weekend. It was my uncle that got me into it. So now look, you can play basketball with me. And he was six foot something. I was like at his shoulders, slightly below his shoulders. So it was difficult, made my life hard, which meant that everyone that was about my height, I was better than. So it made things difficult in some ways, but then when it was like a level playing field, it meant that it was better. And that's one of the definitions of exercise, really. You make things difficult in the gym or outside when you're training yourself, if you will. It means that when that it's no longer so bad, you're actually better because of it. That's why people like wear like weighted vests because when the vest comes off, oh my god, how much easier is it when you take it off? It feels like a breath of fresh air sometimes. So that's that's kind of been the way I see it. Same thing when I played tennis. I was I'd work myself for hours to get better at something because I knew that I could improve myself. I think excelling and improving myself was something that I've been doing since I was very little and it just got easier it just became natural so combining that with okay i'm going to be a business owner now because i was an awful employee so i was really i didn't i didn't like taking orders all that much uh, even from myself let's be honest so it was something that i always felt different always felt like i couldn't relate to a lot of people if you don't know anything about cf you can also catch it um, not catch it, but from others, you can sort of exaggerate your symptoms because of cross-infection, basically. So, like, if there was a school with two of us in the school, one of us had to go somewhere else. It was that sort of, I was the only one in the school that could have it, if that makes sense. So there was no support group. There's no, like, oh, we'd all get together once a week and talk about our problems. It was isn't the same thing. So it was very much individual. It is isolating in itself, and that taught me a couple of things. Sometimes it can be difficult, but that that's that's the same with everybody. I, I think people have to realise that I have struggles like anybody else. They just so happen to be different from the average person, but it doesn't stop them from having struggles as well. Um, but that that's something that helped me because it allowed me the space to work on myself it allowed me the space to do my own thing start the personal training business I moved into tennis coaching as well so that was something that again it's like the product of improving myself was what allowed me to move into the space of helping others yeah thank you for that um a lot of people are defined by their illnesses but it's it seems to be very clear that that you're not and that's uh, it's very refreshing and it's very good, uh, inspirational to speak to someone who's got such a go-getter attitude. Oh, we've got a visitor. I normally You're put. A visitor. <laughs> <laughs> I normally put um, put Frankie in a cupboard. That sounds awful. It's quite a big cupboard. Well, it's not really a cupboard. It's a tiny room. But I feel guilty for doing it. She's licking me, she's smelling my armpit. I did have another question there, but I've completely gone off track. Going back to your childhood, and, and I don't want to labour on this too much because, you you know, you, I don't want to labour your cystic fibrosis too much um, because there's so much more about you that you've achieved, you know, in terms of your career. And it does sound as though you were very much a go-getter when you were younger, and, you, and from a very early age, you didn't like to be defined by your illness. However... W did you fear anything as a child? Quite often, it doesn't come from you. It comes from those around you. It comes from, like, your parents. It comes from the teachers, people who have been diagnosed with certain illnesses, and, and they're the ones that 
kind of label in us in a way and 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 make us feel that we have limitations. Did you have any fears as a child and how have you overcome those fears to get where you are today? Well, I think like like anything, we we fear to lose what we have to a certain degree, but then we fear the unknown as well. So in my case, at first, I... I didn't really have any oh. limitations. I didn't. Oh. Got, yeah, the cat's going crazy. <laughs> so uh, anyway, <laughs> let's just go with this. Yeah. Oh no, it's all right. It's it. Uh, it's nice to have a chuckle sometimes. Um, so yeah, when I when I was younger, it was something that I guess because I had limitations, sort of naturally, I sort of I I think I tried to test them a little bit. Raw because I had them anyway, like a natural sort of ceiling. It was like, well, what can I do with what I have, so to speak? So I didn't have that limitations in terms of when I was little, like sort of pre-teens. It wasn't really as bad. But when I was in in high school, it was different. It's a high school in the the UK, so it was difficult for me to make friends because it was already difficult for me to make friends. Um, because of the treatments and the medications and everything that I was on, I didn't have the luxury, call it luxury, of a very good social life. So sleepovers wasn't really a thing. Um, it wasn't something that I could do. So just that, just that as an example, sort of give you an idea on how strict I had to be, how strict my parents had to be, and how it sort of shaped me is, well, eventually you do learn to be okay with your own company. I think that's something that is a benefit. Um, but when you're in high school, you know, sometimes your friends go with you, sometimes they don't. It was difficult. It was isolating, combined with the fact that I, did, I, I didn't really like some of the things that my friends did, which was difficult when you know, you're trying to keep the friends that you've got and not, and try and make new ones as well. Again, it's just not it's just not an easy thing to do. It's not something to uh, not something to cherish or celebrate, but that meant that again, I was able to focus on me. So that this was the phase of my time when I had to. I had no other choice. So when you've got no other choice, it makes life easier. Sometimes people have too much choice. And that can, that can slow people down. That's why people get overwhelmed. That's when people, like, fear starts to settle in. Not because they fear of whatever it is. It's because they can't make a decision. They can't actually decide what they want to do because they've got too many options. And sometimes just two options can be too many. So for me, it was, well, can I do this? Can I do that? Well, no, because of this. So it made things easier because I had the limitations, because I had the constraints, which I do take into my business now. So it makes my life easier rather than figure out what I can do, turn around and say, right, well, what do I not want to do? And I get rid of all those things and I figure out what's left. It makes things easier to get rid of what you don't really want to do. And it wasn't easy, wasn't straightforward. Um, I think deep down, because we didn't know how could get quite morbid now, but because I didn't know how long I had at the time, my parents were like, just do what you want, you know, just, if you want to do this, fine, we want to do that, you're okay, as long as you're healthy and happy, then, and so are we. So, so they, I didn't have the whole, so they you've got you. to be a doctor, so it was a weird <laughs> thing. Okay, so did they spoil you? Um, I don't think so. Mm. I, don't, I, I wouldn't say I was spoiled in that I had everything everything I wanted. I think there was a part of me that didn't really want things. I don't know why. I think <clears throat> I think that sort of motivation to, <clears throat> excuse me, the motivation to, oh, I need loads of stuff. And that, that just didn't really, that just didn't really sit because the, motiv the motivation to do stuff wasn't to prove people wrong or to prove that I'm better than somebody else because deep down I knew that I wasn't because I had the health conditions. So that wasn't something that I carried into, I need all the stuff. 
because I've got to prove to people that I'm better than them. It just didn't really didn't happen. I didn't have that thought process when I was growing up. So okay. I think it was like, well, things that I want, they're just it's because I actually wanted them. They're a bit more genuine, I guess, because I didn't have that sort of, I've got to be the best. I've got to have the nicest shoes or the whatever it was because it just didn't it just didn't happen there was no situation where I needed that let's talk about what it is that you're doing now Mike so you've moved over to Lanzarote yeah how long have you lived in Lanzarote how did that move come about and uh yeah you know what what are you up to over there I know business-wise you've got a lot going on at the moment I believe you're working on a summit Can you tell us a little bit more about that as well? So you've got like three questions in one there. We're on day four. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the move was something that tested me, something that I wanted, I wanted to do. Um, But I think there was a part of me that felt not not a sense of responsibility to do it, but how can I put it? Because my, my focus is on like mindset and overcoming like fears and being confident with what it is that you're doing, I didn't want to sort of succumb to my own with the move. So I felt like, well, there's no point in me preaching something and giving people advice on something if I'm not taking it myself. So I wanted to do it. I broke it down. I figured out, okay, do I really want to do it? Or am I just convincing myself that I want something that I don't actually want? And then it was like, well, I know I do want to do it because the lifestyle's better. It's sunnier more often. It's just cleaner as well. It feels better, which is a, an amazing feeling for, for my health side of things, just as a starting point. So that was something that was a big tick in the box of just do it. Um, but I felt like I couldn't just not do it because of a story that I told myself. So, because it was, it was literally just a story of, well, you can't do it because of this, this, and this. I was like, well, are they actually true, or am I just making stuff up to convince myself not to bother? And it was the second one. So, I thought, right, I've got to put it in place. I've got to do it. I've got to shift how I make my income business-wise. I have to figure out how I'm going to manage it. And I've actually got to get on a plane only book one ticket instead of two because <laughs> I'm used to buying a return flight. So it was like, oh, we can do just one-way flights. So that, that was something that I had to sort of make real, which is it's always harder when it's real, despite what anyone will say. If you've never had to make big things real, then you don't know what it's like. So the amount of people that were saying, oh, I bet you're so excited. And I'm like, mm, I wouldn't say excitement was the right word I would use. Um, I'm worried. I'm anxious. I can't sleep. <laughs> I'm sort of stressed out all the time. So much planning to do, you would not believe. And they looked at me and sort of like, well, aren't you supposed to be happy? So clearly you've never actually tried to go after what it is that you want. It's not easy. It's not straightforward. It's very complicated. And if it's not, your brain makes it complicated. doesn't matter how simple it is. There could only be three steps. You know, pack, flight, book a place on the other side. But we make it complicated, and I made it complicated. And I had to to get over my own own fears, essentially, to be able to make it work. So Mm. it was a big learning curve for me. It was a big sense of practicing what I... And and look, well done. Well done on being brave. It's not easy. I'm an expat myself. I moved to Dubai 10 years ago. I know it's not easy. There's a lot of challenges. And, you know, being away from home, being away from your family, uh, just like little things, not being able to go down the chippy and things like that, just like like British things that you like. And yeah, there are a lot of things that you miss about home, being an expat, good things about it as well. And it, you know, it just, it takes a special someone, I think, to be able to take that move and to do it. And and well done. Well done. Tell us a little bit about what you've got going on business wise. I'd like to hear about the summit that is happening. Um, Is that something that you've organized or is it something that you're taking part? Who are the other guest speakers and what is the purpose of it? Well, the, the summit came about, it's one of the, the brands that I co-own. So there's three of us that run, uh, it's called Rise Up Entrepreneurs. So there's three of us, we all have our own like specialisms, we have our own sort of, this is what we're best at. 
thought we we sort of came together to bit of a more of a collaboration effort, I suppose. But we knew that you know three heads are better than one. You know, we're better than the sum of our parts almost. So we've got a magazine that that's my sort of baby, if you will. That's the thing that that I focus on. And we've got summits. We we do events. We've got Facebook groups. We run meetups as well. So if people are local and they want to meet up, you know, business owners or whatever the, I think we've got one that focuses on mums that are entrepreneurs. So depending on who runs it, because we have like leaders, we call them, that they sort of lead their own their own meetups. It's something that we we started a while back, and we sort of went. Not, we didn't we wouldn't want to go as far as to say we winged it. We had an idea on what we wanted. But other than that, it has literally been as it went. We sort of rolled with the punches the entire time. Uh, the summit's gone really well. We've had, I think we're on over 100 people signing up. We've got over 20 or 30 speakers. We've got people talking about some minds like mindset. We've got people on like high end selling, networking, someone I think is talking about like podcasting. So he's got a top 100 podcast. So he's given a talk on how to do that yourself, which is pretty cool. Is this, um, and it's just. Sorry for interrupting. Is the summit, is this summit okay. now, is the summit now digital? It is. So we had a bit of a, a brainstorm when lockdown initially started so here in spain it's a, it's, a, it's a part of spain we are on i think week six or seven of the lockdown um, and because of my health conditions i was maybe one or two days before that buying food and making sure i had enough supplies for like a week or two just in case because we didn't know what was happening um and it literally changed overnight so the Spanish president was sort of like, nope, we're not going to wait until X date. We're going to do it tonight, which was like not so bad for me because I, I, I already bought supplies. But the amount of people that were like, great, it's happening right now and I've not bought anything and I've not got food. And I, so there were some people that were struggling. People have lost their jobs. It's not an amazing space. Um, but because of that, we had a we had a conversation that the three of us we were like, okay, we have got events that are happening this year, events that are happening next year. What are we gonna do? So in a nutshell, we brought the summit online. That was always gonna be the way it was gonna go. The summit was always gonna be online, but the offline side we've had to sort of set a deadline for whether it was gonna go ahead or not. We had to work quite closely with like venues and things of that nature just to be sure that, okay, can we cancel this thing like quite conveniently if the world doesn't recover and things like that. So it's it's something that we've got we've got to work quite closely with it. There's only so much we can do. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it is virtual and it's it's um I think we're on day four right now and uh, it finishes on Saturday. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well done for that. Uh you know, I mean, you've adapted a lot of businesses are, are having to do that and come up with different alternative ways of working or, or for many, uh, you know, this lockdown and the current climate has literally just kick-started a lot of the, the business, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs, freelancers into doing or upgrading their digital platforms, which a lot of them probably meant to do anyway. I've been meaning to do this for a long time. I speak to so many different people who are working on their webinars, they're working on their, their training. And yeah, it's been on their to-do list for a long time. And regardless of where we go in the future and, and how long we're going to be like this for, I don't think any of that's going to be in vain because it's always going to be there to create a passive income stream. Yeah, I mean, from, from my own perspective as well, I think, I, I personally, I think the world's not really going to be the same again. I, I really don't. I think the world is going to change because the way viruses work as well, we build up immunity, but then the virus gets smart as well. So it's not just us that come up with the vaccines and the antibodies and everything else. The viruses can become resistant. 
you know, antibiotic resistant illnesses and all that sort of stuff. So more than anything, this is going to be the first time that the virus has beat us, our ability to cope with it. Because in the past, it's been, oh, we'll just do this, we'll just do that, we'll just look after ourselves and it'll all work out great. This is the first time that the virus has gone pretty much worldwide before we've been able to come up with a solution. So is the world going to change? I I, I think it is. I agree with you. Will businesses still run? And I think think it's just going to be, as you said, the, the online side can be the sort of, the top up of the income just in case they're out of business or they lose their job or they've got to reduce their hours. I, I, I personally don't think that we'll go back to what we used to think was normal anytime soon. That, that's my that's my take on it anyway. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just speaking to, um, to Farah, who I was going to come on live with before I spoke to you. I was telling her about a live stream that I watched yesterday with Dave Crane, a fellow northerner. He's uh, quite a mm. renowned public speaker here in the in the Middle East. And every day during lockdown, he's been doing one live stream a day and with a co-host. I can't remember the name of his co-host, but yesterday they were talking about how the days of standing on a stage and delivering your speeches, your keynote speeches, they're actually over. So people are having to adapt and they're having to like look at different ways of working. I hope yeah. that in the future we are going to get back to, to how it was I- a couple of months ago, uh, last year. And um, I really hope that this is not going to have a long-term impact. But for the here and now, I do feel as though it is and that we have got to adapt to that. There are massive changes. You were talking about that virus. Um, there's changes because of the way that it's because of the impact that it's had on the economy, because of the impact that it's had on business. it's. I think you and I have got very different opinions and views on this virus. Um, so, but there's something that you can't argue about is, you know, the impact that it has had on the world economy and that yeah. it has on businesses and it has had on, on livelihoods. But the virus, I keep saying virus to me, because I'm very, I, I just question, I think we've all been, uh, probably not good for me to go down there, because there's, <laughs> but, you know, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of um, fear-mongering gone on and a lot of untruths gone on here. And what the mainstream media are telling us is is far from what has actually happened. That aside, the impact it's had on the global economy is devastating, and it's it, it's going to, it's going to take a long time for people to recover. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure they're not telling us the whole truth either way, whether we don't know it, whether people do know it and they're just not, not telling us, whether they're only telling us the best of what they have, whether it's right or wrong. I mean, I, I agree with you on that point in that we've got no idea what's actually going on. Um, are we being fed information? Maybe, but if you're on Facebook, for example, it's only your friends. So... Nine times out of ten, it's going to be word of mouth and Chinese whispers anyway. So it's not going to be the whole truth either way, depending on, on where you get your sources from, right? So do, do I do I think it, it's real? I think it's real. I mean, you know, whether... That wasn't a question. I think it's probably best we don't even go down that road, to be honest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that wasn't a question. Um, okay. So, listen, I'm conscious that we have been talking for, like, half an hour now. Sorry to kind of cut you off there. Um, I know That's all right. I'm all right. Go for it. We've been trying to set this up for some time now, and I really appreciate your time, and I appreciate you coming on. I think one of the things that I want to sort of end with is that we can very often think that when we try to grow ourselves or we try to change ourselves – it starts with the possibility of being wrong about something. So a lot of talk is about, oh, we've got to change, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. But the only way you can change or improve is if you think that where you are right now, whether it's a bad thing, whether you're unhappy. You know, a lot lot of people don't change unless they're unhappy enough to warrant the change. Or you don't change your mind unless 
you are wrong, and a lot of people don't like that. It's not that they don't like change, it's that they don't like being proved wrong. They don't like being wrong, and that can stop people from change because that's the first step, right? The first step to change your improvement. Okay, well, where you are right now, you want to not be happy about that. You've got to not like that. You've got to have something there, whether it's wrong or not good enough or whatever it is, to then say, right, I'm going to go ahead and change that. So it's not easy. I, I've had that, you know, with the health conditions, with losing family, losing friends. I've had loads of moments where I've had to sit back and reassess everything. There are people out there that don't have that. So, you know, a lot of people don't change. They don't change because they've not got the reason to. So one of the things that I do try to explain or I do try to get across is sometimes you've got to create it. You've got to decide that you want more, that you deserve more, that the way things are right now, you're not happy with. And that that's what I would say. That's sometimes fantastic. Sometimes you have got to create it yourself. Okay, guys. Okay, thank you so much. And guys, I'd like to thank you guys on Facebook and on YouTube for tuning in and listening. And I would like to thank the podcast audience for listening and thank you till next time and i'd also like to give a shout out to rove hotel as well in dubai marina the rove hotel support the podcast at the moment i'm doing it via Streamyard and via zoom but however they normally support the podcast and they are thinking about setting up their own podcast studio that is going uh. to be free for people to use as well so just putting that out there um, for all you fellow podcasters. Mike, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.